Uh, Jim DiEugenio is a veteran author and researcher, lately focusing on JFK's foreign policy. He's the author of Destiny Betrayed, JFK Cuba and the Garrison Case, now in its second edition. He's a regular guest on Lano Sanex Black Op Radio. He writes for Robert Perry's Consortium News, and he's the principal behind one of the most active and important assassination websites, www.kennedysandking.com, which is constantly updated with new articles, book reviews, and important news about the assassinations of both JFK, RFK, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., among a lot of other uh, interesting items. Uh, I want to kind of title this, uh, The JFK Assassination uh, in the Public Mind. I hope we'll be able to talk about, not so much about the events of the assassination and all that, but kind of the ebb and flow of the public perception of the case over the years, go over the long-term cover-up in the press and officialdom, um, and look into how efforts like people like the early researchers, Jim Garrison and Oliver Stone, uh, were able to bring the facts of the case to light, and then look at some of the different ways the official story has changed from the HSCA to the ARRB. Uh, I know it's a big topic, but I hope we can make a, a dent in it, and there are definitely few, if any, who know the history of the case like Jim, so I appreciate your, your talking to me today. Okay, you're welcome, David. Uh, I guess I was thinking that uh, we could start with there is the 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 period between the assassination itself and um and when the Warren Commission comes out. Um I wonder if you could talk about what maybe the view of the case in the public at that time was, what were the actors controlling the narrative and was there really any dissent to to the narrative that uh, some of the larger media outlets were putting out? The period of time you're talking about is a pro lasts approximately about 10 to 11 months, all right, from November to 22nd, 1963, until the issuance of the Warren Report at the end of September 1964, and then the issuance of the volumes, uh, the 26 volumes of exhibits and testimony, which is in, the, I think, the third week of October of 1964. Now, this is a very, very, very important time period for a couple of reasons. Number one, the Warren Commission, for whatever reason, decided to work in secret. All right? In other words, the actual hearings, except for two exceptions, were not open to the public. All right. So in other words, neither the media or public citizens uh, could actually get in to the depositions and the, the hearings in Washington. All right. And so therefore, everything that was said in those depositions and hearings uh, was not privy to the media, the newspapers, to TV or to the public at large. So nobody knew what was happening. Now, the, I mentioned two exceptions. The only exceptions were the appearances of Mark Lane, who demanded they be open to the public. All right? So those are the only exceptions to the, I think there were something like 500 witnesses. All right? So only Mark Lane's uh, were actually open to the public. All right? Now, well, so in other words, this leaves a question, how did the public get its information about what was happening in the case? And the answer to that question was through leaks. In other words, deliberate leaks. You know, by uh, the major one was uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, Clyde Tolson, and their underlings would leak information to the press that would get into the news cycle, and almost every single one of those leaks, well, not almost everyone, but everyone, every single one of those leaks was incriminating to Oswald. And this is how they built up this uh, press uh, drumbeat for Oswald's guilt. It's astonishing when you think of it that 
the press did not complain about this. It's really surprising in retrospect because the, 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 today, of course, no matter what happens, the press is right there pounding on the door saying we have a right to be here. That didn't happen with the Warren Commission. Very, very weird in, 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 in retrospect. And so because of that arrangement, when the Warren report was issued and the accompanying lines were issued, the mainstream media accepted it with open arms. In fact, that's, a, that's an understatement. It was more than open arms. It was accepted with unanimous and incredibly powerful praise for the effort. Now, how could that happen, of course, on the first or second day if the report's 888 pages long? And the answer is, it couldn't have happened. That was not a legitimate reaction. The, again, this was basically through leaks, all right, and it was basically uh, through accommodating people in the press. To give you a, a, the greatest example I, I know of is that on the day the one report was issued, CBS News put together a special report praising the Warren Report. Now, how on earth do you read 888 pages in one day and put together a documentary special? And the answer is it's impossible. All right, so in other words, somebody was accommodating CBS. CBS was very appreciative of those efforts, all right? And so therefore, in advance of the release, they were sort of like acting as a public relations outfit for the one report. That's how bad, that's how bad the, the mainstream media was. And that's why that's such an important time period. But there was one thing that was wrong. There was one thing that the mainstream media could not erase. And that was the image of Jack Ruby shooting Oswald in the basement of the Dallas Police City Hall live on television. That particular event was the one fly in the ointment, so to speak. So that, therefore, in 1964, public belief in what the government was saying and doing took a toboggan slide downward when the Warren Report was issued. Because nobody, nobody could possibly believe that Jack Ruby... Uh, killed Lee Harvey Oswald uh, because he he didn't want to see her come to Dallas for a trial. That was the one fly in the ointment. Okay. No. So, well, so let me ask: Were there? I mean, was the media uh, coverage basically uniform? Were there not maybe smaller newspapers or some reporters in Dallas? Was there any? There were very, very, very few dissenters at that time. Very few. There was Mark Lane. Okay, and Mark Mark Lane was a, a valiant crusader up there in New York. All right, there was an article in the New Republic by a college professor named Stoughton Lind. Okay, um, and there was a article in the Nation. Okay, about the um, the ear witnesses mm. in Dealey Plaza uh, hearing. Um, shots from the grassy knoll. So that, and of course, Lane's article in The Guardian, that was a left-wing socialist um, a publication. All right, But that particular article caused that particular issue of the, Garden, of the Guardian to sell, if I remember correctly, about close to 100,000 copies. And that was about it. And that was about it for the dissenting views. On the on the uh, on the Oswald did it verdict. Wow. So, so okay. So then you brought us up to the point. The Warren Commission comes out. I don't think we have to go over what is in there. I think most everybody knows that. But then you do have this group of these early books that kind of come out in between the release of the Warren Commission and say the start of um, Jim Garrison's case. Do you want to talk about some of the? Yeah, there were there were several early books for example, but they were published in Europe originally. Okay, this was by Thomas Buchanan, an, an American expatriate uh, living in France at the time. All right, and then there was another book by Joachim Justine, okay, who uh, I think was a German or Austrian, 
who fled the Third Reich, okay, and he wrote an interesting book. I think it was uh, Oswald Assassin or Fall Guy, all right, and the Warren Commission was aware of those two books, and they got um, information on them through, the, I think, the CIA, all right, um, but then, because those books were written abroad, okay, um, they didn't have quite the impact that the first um, writers did in, in, in the United States. The first writers who really viciously attacked, I mean, and I mean really hard attacks on the Warren Report, which of course deserved it, were uh, Vincent Salandria, Harold Weisberg, Ed, Edward Epstein, Mark Lane, and uh, Josiah Thompson, all right, and also uh, Richard Pompkin. Those authors, um, for example, Thompson's book, Six Seconds in Dallas, was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, uh, spent something like a combined 50 weeks on the New York Times uh, bestseller list, all right? Um, so those books really began to have an impact on the public psyche, all right, because they sold so well. And uh, they actually, and back in those days, I mean, it's, I know it's hard to believe for us today, but back in those days, Mark Lane actually got on national television, you know, which is pretty much unheard of today. I mean, today, uh, the critics of the Warren Report can't even get on cable television, all right? But back then, you know, Mark Lane actually got on national television, which, was, which is, is, is an amazing feat for considering what we're up against today. And so those books began to have, those books and essays, began to have a very, very powerful impact on the public psyche. All right, and this really, really kind of undermined the, uh, the, the belief that the government was telling the truth about the JFK assassination. All right, now, the next big step, of course, was when Jim Garrison began to work on the JFK case because Oswald had been in New Orleans for about six or seven months in the uh, in the year 1963, from about April of 1963 until the last few days of September 1963. Oswald had been in New Orleans. And so Garrison had done a, a very brief and cursory investigation in... Uh, right after the assassination, and then he turned over his suspect, David Ferry, to the FBI. Uh, the FBI essentially let David Ferry lie his head off to them, all right, and then they let him go, and uh, so Garrison dropped the investigation, all right, it was something he regretted later, all right. So when all the controversy began to hit, Garrison reopened his investigation in the fall of 1966, all right, and he worked on the case for about, I'd say about three months before uh, his investigation was exposed by the local press, and then uh, that story went nationwide, okay, and really that was a very serious blow to Garrison because when he was working in secret, a relative secret. Uh, he was making very good progress. You know, it's it's when he began to be attacked by the national media, all right, to do the exposure of his investigation by the local papers, you know, that he began to get kind of waylaid and trapped, okay, uh, by let's let us say not very honorable reporters who really had a hidden agenda which was to have no investigation of all, at all, of the JFK case. And so what happened then is you had two nationally televised programs, one by NBC, 
in one of four part series uh, by CBS, the NBC program was directly aimed at Jim Garrison. The CBS program was aimed at reviving the Warren Report, right? They were both, and I've written about both of them, uh, to show just how bad they were. But they were pretty horrible, okay? And, and, and the, the, the listener or the reader can go ahead and find those articles online. The one I did about CBS, um, you can see at my website, Kennedy's and King, that's the long version. Or the short version, which is at Consortium News, Bob Perry's website, How CBS Aided the JFK Cover-Up. And that was done, that particular article was done because uh, the, I knew a friend, a friend of mine, Roger Feynman, used to work for CBS, and he protested what he saw CBS doing in their 1967 and 1975 programs, all right? And uh, he obtained some of the documentation showing just how CBS had violated its own standards and practices in order to cut corners and essentially deceive the public all right, about the facts of the Warren Report. And they also led John McCloy, who was, of course, one of the Warren Commissioners, perform as a consultant to the program. Mm. Now, that, of course, is a violation of any journalistic, you know, canon. You can't have a guy who you're supposed to be investigating, you know, having input to the program that's supposed to expose him. Okay, but that, right. but that's what they did, and they kept that a secret. They kept that a secret for for years and years on end. You know, so that's how bad the mainstream media was on both the Garrison investigation and in defending the Warren report. Now, uh, now one of the most interesting things, the most interesting event that I can think of, is the fact that. Jim Garrison, in response to that NBC show, basically attacking him, was able to go on national TV and do a 30-minute spot basically about his case. Can you talk about that and, and the effect that had, and also about his appearance on Johnny Carson and Steve Allen and kind of how that stuff played into the, into the public sentiment? Um, what you're talking about is that after Walter Sheridan uh, produced his hit piece on Garrison, which was in the summer of 1967, it was so obviously one-sided and so obviously a hatchet job that um, Garrison was allowed to petition the FCC under the Equal Time and the Fairness Doctrine, which, of course, we don't have anymore. See, Back in those days, if you were unfairly attacked, okay, in the mass media, all right, especially the broadcast media, you could petition the Federal Communications Commission under the doctrines of the Fairness Doctrine and Equal Time, all right, okay? And they would grant you, if you proved your case, they would grant you that privilege. That Actually, it's a right. All right. And so Garrison did, all right, and it was it was remarkable that the FCC actually decided in his favor, although it only gave him thirty minutes, the show was sixty minutes. All right. And so he was allowed to go on national T V and he did a, a pretty nice he didn't really devote the time to rebutting the charges in the show. He went for a broader conspectus on the case about the autopsy evidence and the Warren Commission working on secret. Okay, uh, and that was well. Garrison was allowed to address the public. Now, the second appearance that you're talking about that was on the Tonight Show, and that was arranged by Mort Saul. Mort Saul, of course, was a nationally still around today, 
was a nationally known comedian, all right, who was very interested in the Kennedy case because he was a friend of the of John F. Kennedy, all right, and so he was disturbed by what had happened with the Warren Commission, and he had been hosting a local radio show out in Los Angeles at the time. 1966, 1967. Show was doing very well, and he frequently bought up the Kennedy assassination. And once he started doing that, he ran into some trouble with station management. Okay? All right. So he went down to visit Jim Garrison, and he came away favorably impressed. And when he started giving Garrison favorable press on his radio show, the show was terminated. So later on, he went on a Tonight Show on an appearance, and towards the end of his appearance, he turned to the audience and said, wouldn't you like to hear from Jim Garrison himself on your show about what he's discovering down there in New Orleans about the Kennedy assassination? And the crowds vociferously replied, yes, we would. And so Carson was trapped, you know, on camera, all right, and so he had to agree to go ahead and put Garrison on. But, see, this was the problem. The problem was, The Tonight Show was on NBC, which was the same program that had been the production entity for Walter Sheridan's hatchet job, okay? So... The people who ran NBC at that time, David and and, and Robert Sarnoff, okay, were not going to go ahead and let Garrison, you know, essentially obliterate the hour-long show again on national TV. So what they did, of course, is they heavily prepared Johnny Carson, all right, and for a number of days in advance, and in fact, when Garrison came in that day, all right, the NBC lawyers interviewed him and they prepared cue cards for Johnny Carson. So from the minute Garrison came on, it was not an interview. It was an NBC lawyer-sponsored inquisition. All right? Okay, and it got so bad that by the end of the show, the audience was, you know, who, you know, Carson had been a very famous and popular host, but they were favoring Jim Garrison. And you can hear when Garrison says that Lyndon Johnson sponsored the cover-up up for the Warren Commission, and Carson goes, well, why would he do something like that? And Garrison says, words of the effect, I don't know, why don't you ask him, Johnny? And everybody cracked up. Okay, and Carson was humiliated. And after the show, after the show, Carson was so angry that he turned to Mort Saul, who was in the wings there, and said, you're never going to be on this program again. And by the way, he wasn't. Hmm. It, w- it wasn't until Carson retired and Jay Leno took over the show that Mort Saul came back on The Tonight Show. Wow. That's, how, that's how angry Carson was about the whole affair. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, There's there's one other subject I want to ask about because I think, you might correct me, I don't know a whole lot about this, but I think it was kind of the government's reaction to the Garrison case was the the Clark uh, panel, which I guess you can tell us about it, but if, if that's right, that it was a reaction to the Garrison case, and then this was where they moved the the bullet hole on the back of the head by four inches. Is this is this correct? And was that a response to Gary? Yes. The the okay. Now the Ram. What you're talking about is a Ramsey Clark panel, which was prepared in actually 19. I think either commissioned in late 1967, studied in 1968, but not released until the eve of the Clay Shaw trial. So. It was originally started for to counteract the impact of Josiah Thompson's book, Six Seconds in Dallas, all right, 
because in his in that book, he had access to the Zapruder film because he was working at Life magazine, and he actually was able to put very close illustrations in the book, okay, as to um, the actual shot sequencing, all right? And so one of the illustrations he has in the book is the hit on Kennedy's skull, which, if you recall, the Warren Commission put low on the back of the skull, all right? And then the exit for that shot, which, again, according to the Warren Commission, was above and to the right of the right ear. So if you match up that frame in the Zapruder film, you will see that it makes for an almost impossible trajectory because the bullet comes in low, okay, at the back of the head, and exits high on the top right of the head, all right? Because Kennedy is not nearly, his head is not nearly bent over enough to allow for a straight trajectory. So the government went to work on this. Ramsey Clark appointed a panel, which was led by Russell Fisher, who I believe was the coroner in Baltimore at that time, okay, and very friendly to the government and the CIA. And so he put together a panel that did, I think about, if I remember correctly, something like one week's work on this issue, all right? And so they decided that somehow the original autopsy was wrong, okay? And so they moved down the, excuse me, they moved up the penalty perforation in the back of the skull four inches to the top of the skull, all right, the cowlick area, all right, Mm -hmm. and that was supposed to take care of this problem of the Thompson problem. And they also, by the way, lowered the back one, okay, from the neck, because as everybody knows, Gerald Ford changed the warm report at the last minute. And inst- and he placed the wound in the neck area, the lower neck area, when in fact the original autopsy puts that hole in the back. All right, and so they made those two alterations, and then they waited. They waited until jury selection in the Clay Shaw trial down in New Orleans to release that official report, which still backed the official version that Oswald had killed Kennedy, but it changed the autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in other words, no, and again, this tells you how bad the mainstream media is on the JFK case. Because again, the Clark panel was accepted, okay? And I can't remember anybody asking any questions about, wait a minute, how, how do you change an autopsy without exhuming the body? But that's what they did. Hmm. That's what they did, all right? Now, the other problem with that, the Clark panel, of course, is that suddenly was the appearance of the so-called 6.5 millimeter fragment on the x-rays, all right? Because they had to have something to base upon, you know, raising this wound in the back four inches. Right. So, so suddenly they have the 6.5 millimeter fragment on the x-rays which the House Select Committee also backed, which, unfortunately for them, none of the doctors remembered seeing that night. All right? So you have this, you know, incredible appearance out of the shadows of this supposed 6.5 mil, which, of course, 
matches the ammunition that the Warren Commission said that Oswald used. So that's another example of the government working in secret and going ahead and trying to bushwhack, you know, the Jim Garrison investigation down there. All right, now also in the declassified documents we have from the ARB, the CIA put together something called the Garrison Group, which we have, I think, four meetings of in which the CIA began to map out actions against Jim Garrison because at the first meeting of the Garrison Group, Ray Rocca, who was Jim Angleton's first assistant, said that if words of the effect that if Garrison is allowed to proceed, uh, Clay Shaw will be convicted. And that was in September of 1967. All right. And so the CIA now began to go ahead and map out uh, actions they could take. One of them was interfering in the subpoena process. We have that in documents now, that the CIA sent lawyers out to go ahead and talk to judges in certain areas where Garrison was issuing subpoenas so that the subpoenas would not be served upon their subjects. And we even have cases where the CIA went ahead and interfered uh, down in New Orleans with judges who were issuing subpoenas. And we also have, of course, the CIA, what they call the cleared attorneys panel. Um, what that is, is that in New Orleans, when Garrison's investigation uh, after it was exposed and he began interviewing witnesses and, and issuing subpoenas in New Orleans, the Clay Shaw's lawyers, um, especially Irvin Diamond, began to recruit other lawyers uh, in order to give these people, these prospective witnesses, prospective suspects, uh, furnished them with attorneys the CIA would pay for. It. All right. And we, uh, we have that in writing also. For example, Gordon Novell, uh, when he fled New Orleans, because Garrison wanted to call him before the grand jury, ended up with four lawyers who, under deposition uh, in a legal proceeding, he admitted he wasn't paying for them. They were being, in his phrase, they were being remunerated uh, by other sources. Okay. Mm. So that, that's how extensive the government apparatus was. And, of course, we also know the FBI was tapping Garrison's phone and putting bugs into his office and following him around, okay, uh, where, where he went to. All right, so that scene in JFK, in the Oliver Stone's movie, where they discover a bug in the wall, that's based upon fact, all right? All right, so those are some of the, some of the things that the government did to thwart Garrison. So now how did, uh, how did the case itself, as that was going on, play out in the media? Were you able to read about the case in the New York Times and the Washington Post, or did, did the major media treat it as a, a non-event? We know that they trashed Garrison a lot. Well, the only newspapers that you could get any continuous um, coverage of was down in New Orleans. All right, the States item and the Times Picayune. In the other major news outlets, um, newspaper outlets, that would be the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times. They is, what they did is they assigned reporters who they essentially read the riot act to. And one example would be Jerry Cohen of the LA Times. All right. Uh, and they essentially said, we're not going to give you any, don't give this guy any quarter. All right, we're going to go after him the whole time, even even when they knew better. For example, Ed Gutman was one of the editors of the LA Times at the time of the Garrison case, okay, when Garrison was doing his investigation. And since he had worked for Robert Kennedy, all right, he had some uh, inside information to the Justice Department. Well, Gutman, remember, Gutman's supervising this negative 
coverage through Cohen of Garrison. All right, and I actually wrote Gutman about this, you know, and and uh, he told me he put his top guys on it. All right, and said Garrison didn't have anything. Well, it later turns out that Gutman knew through his sources at the Justice Department that Clay Shaw was Clay Bertrand. All right, and that was declassified by that that note was declassified by the ARB. So, in other words, even though Gutman knew that one of the prime theses of Garrison's inquiry that Shaw was Bertrand, even though he knew that was true, he still sent Cohen out to go ahead and do a hit job on Jim Garrison. All right. Now, let me, to people who don't know why that's important, Dean Andrews, a New Orleans lawyer, all right, was solicited by a guy he called Clay Bertrand, okay, to go to Dallas and defend Oswald within 24 hours of the assassination, all right? Okay, when Jim Garrison asked, interviewed Andrews, and said, who's this Clay Bertrand guy? Andrews would not tell him, and he eventually told him that, look, if I tell you who this guy is, okay, uh, my physical well-being is going to be in danger, right? And by the way, Andrews was always consistent with that. Andrews was always consistent with that because he told the same thing to Mark Lane before Garrison. He told the same thing to Anthony Summers after the Garrison interview. All right. Well, if Bertrand was Clay Shaw, which is what Garrison came to the conclusion of, okay, then the obvious question is why would Shaw uh, call Andrews to go to Dallas? to defend Oswald. Very interesting question, which he never got the chance to, to uh, ask him because of people like Ed Gutman saying that his investigation was up a creek without a paddle, when in fact they knew that he was crying. And by the way, the FBI knew that also. The FBI knew that too. That's how Gutman knew. Because the FBI had been furnished, uh, we again have this through the ARB declassification process, the FBI had been furnished information about Clay Shaw in December of 1963. Hmm. In other words, their original inquiry into the JFK case, they were getting information about Shaw. And they had come to the conclusion also that Shaw was Bertrand. Okay? So the FBI knew, the Justice Department knew, Ed Gutman knew, but, but we have this sorry spectacle. They're all denying it in public. See, this is what I mean when I talk about the schizoid nature of the American press on the JFK case, all right? And this, you know, descends into the public, all right? So we have this, I don't know what you would call it, you know, you would have like a split personality. You know, people knowing certain things are true and accurate but being forced to deny them in public for, I assume, the public consumption. But the problem is that who are they kidding? Because most of the public doesn't believe this story anyway. Right. So th this is a really kind of, you know, if we had this patient in a psychiatrist's office, the very interesting advice that the psychiatrist gives that person you know, as to why are you doing what you're doing when it makes absolutely no sense and does not align with the facts. So that's how weird, that's how special the whole mainstream media's relationship to the John F. Kennedy case is, you know? All right. All right. Uh, all right, so let's, you know, I guess the Garrison case is happening through the late 60s, So, but you've also got Vietnam going on then you're kind of moving into the Watergate era and basically trust in the government is just completely collapsed. So that leads to this Rockefeller Commission, which partially investigated some aspects of the JFK case, the Church Committee, which investigated the CIA and FBI performance. And then all of that kind of leads us into the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I don't, do you want to talk some about, you know, 
why uh, and what the church committee and Rockefeller committee were, were doing in regard to the JFK case? Okay, this, this erupted after Watergate, okay? There were several people in Washington who believed that the CIA had a larger role in Watergate than what the Urban Committee was willing to um, to reveal about it. And in fact, the minority report, which was authored by the late Fred Thompson, a Tennessee lawyer and a friend of Howard Baker, actually tried to explore that angle. All right. So when the Rockefeller Commission and the Church Committee came out, those were supplemented by the first national showing of the Zapruder film in the summer of 1975. The problem with the Rockefeller Commission was that Gerald Ford and Nelson Rockefeller appointed David Bellin to be the chief counsel. All right. Bellin, of course, was one of the lawyers in the Warren Commission. So that kind of turned out to be a joke. All right. But the church committee had Richard Schweiker and Gary Hart running that particular subcommittee, the church committee. And they actually were very interested in finding out some facts about the JFK case. And in fact, Schweiker, even more than Gary Hart, was convinced that the Warren report was, as he called it, a house of cards, you know, that had collapsed. All right. And he was a guy who actually uh, employed uh, Gayton Fonzie because Fonzie at that time was a reporter for Philadelphia Magazine, and uh, Schweiker was from Pennsylvania. So Gayton Fonzie did a lot of interesting investigation, and that's where the whole idea that Maurice Bishop was David Phillips, okay, that's where it originated, when Gayton Fonzie was working under uh, the Schweiker Hart Committee. And David Church Phillips Frank, being like a big CIA agent officer. Right, right. Yeah, see, David Phillips, of course, was at that time supposedly a retired CIA officer, but he had risen prior to that as the head of the Western Hemisphere. Okay, and during the Kennedy assassination, okay, uh, which of course was November of 63, Phillips was head of the uh, Cuban operations desk out of Mexico City, and he was running also the uh, CIA counterintelligence program against the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which is very interesting, those two positions, because, of course, Oswald was supposed to be the single member of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. There were no other members, and his office just happened to be at 544 Camp Street, where Guy Bannister was located at. All right? And, of course... Oswald allegedly went to Mexico City after he left New Orleans. So Phillips, of course, would be in close proximity, you know, to both of those things. And he had been, Antonio Vesciano, who was a member of Alpha 66, told Gain Fonzi that he saw Bishop with Oswald in the fall of 1963 at the Southland building in Dallas. All right. So that was a very, very important lead. All right. And that, and the church committee investigated their specific assignment was the performance of the FBI and the CIA in relation to the Warren commission. And that was a decidedly negative report. The, the, the church gave me the report on that subject. And they heavily criticized, especially Hoover, the performance of the FBI in relationship to the Warren Commission. And that was the first time that we actually saw that the Warren Commission, at least in official mode, okay, that the Warren Commission was really at the mercy of these other bodies in Washington. It was not in any way an independent inquiry, right? And it relied very heavily 
upon outside agencies like the FBI, the CIA, and the Secret Service. And for the first time, an official body said that those guys didn't do their job very well. All right. That, of course, led to the House Select Committee, which for about eight or nine months, there was really a lot of hope that finally the Kennedy assassination was going to be addressed with a first-rate inquiry because they had hired um, Dick Sprague. Dick Sprague had a marvelous reputation as a Philadelphia district attorney. And I think, if I remember correctly, he had won 73 cases and lost one or two. All right. And he did a lot of homicide investigations. All right. And he um, had solved a very high profile case, the murder of labor leader Jock Yablonski. All right. And so he knew how to investigate murder cases. Okay. And he is very experienced with detectives and policemen. And he was very thorough. Okay. And he, in turn, hired Bob Tannenbaum, who was, uh, I think, head of homicide in the New York City's DA's office, all right? And for the first time, and they had, these guys actually had money. You know, they had a pretty decent budget. See, Jim Garrison didn't have any money, okay? Because and, and he had to go to do these lectures you know, in universities and colleges throughout the country to raise money for his inquiry. Well, these guys were actually going to get hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, in order to do this inquiry. But what happened, of course, is that the big lobbying, the FBI and the CIA, through their, you know, representatives in Congress and on the Hill, began to go ahead and register their disdain for any thorough vetting of either the JFK case or the Martin Luther King case. From Tom Downing, who was the head of that committee at first, he told me that the FBI lobbied against the King case, the CIA lobbied against reopening the JFK case. All right. Then Downing left, and because he, he was a high-profile lawyer in Newport News, Virginia, all right, and... Downing left, and Tony and, and Gonzalez, Henry Gonzalez, the new chairman, got into a personal uh, dust up with Sprague, which ended up spelling both of their exits from the committee. Tannenbaum agreed to stay on for a few months as a caretaker, along with Al Lewis, who was another guy that Sprague brought in from Pennsylvania. And they tried to find a replacement, which was not easy to do. Okay, they, you know, they solicited several people, including uh, Arthur Goldberg. You know, but Goldberg, when he talked to Stansel Turner, he asked him, "Am I going to get the CIA's cooperation?" And Turner essentially said, "I cannot guarantee that," and so he wouldn't take the job. So then they came up with a uh, they came up with a university professor, okay, um, well, Cornell you know, and Notre me, Dame, Bob Blakey, and he took over. Let me stop you before we go into Blakey. How uh, how again was the kind of the press treating? You know, we know that they show the Watergate hearings on national TV. I think they did to the Church Committee at least on public television. Uh, how was the press? reaction to to this committee? Was it taken seriously in the press? The same thing, if you ask me from what I've been able to garner, from what I've been able to get from the newspaper accounts, once Sprague and Tannenbaum were appointed, and once they made clear what they were going to do, all right, Sprague began to be attacked in the press, just like Jim Garrison. All right. And it was in the Washington Post, a guy named Walter Pincus, who was very close to the CIA, and also in the New York Times. Okay. 
uh, and to a lesser extent in the L.A. Times, right? And this began, and also Newsweek, Newsweek, right? And so Sprague began to be viciously attacked, okay? And the reason, of course, if you ask me, I, I think the reason was that the powers that be did not want a real investigation of the JFK case. Because, for example, one of the things that Sprague was very interested in is Silvio Dio. He did not understand why the Warren Commission didn't believe Silvio Dio. All right, this, of course, was the, the witness in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who said that two, two Cubans in Oswald visited her in late September of 1963. Uh, the problem, see, the problem as Sprague saw it was it's very hard to allow for both Oswald being in Silvio Dio's house and Oswald being in Mexico City. And it is very hard. You know, and this is one of the reasons the Warren Commission decided they weren't going to believe Silvio Dio. All right? So if you believe he's at Silvio Dio's house, then you have a problem with Mexico City. If you believe in Mexico City, then you have a problem with Silvio Dio. But the problem is, Silvio Dio is a very good witness because she told more than one person about this visit before the assassination. Plus, she had her sister there, Annie. Okay? So, it, it became a very... And in fact, Sylvia Marr thought so highly of Silvio Dio that she actually... Um, put a heading on her chapter called The Proof of the Plot when she discussed the Soviet Odeo aspect of the case. The other thing that Sprague was interested in is he what to set up experiments about the single bullet theory, and he was going to do them in public, except they were going to be real experiments, okay? Not setups like the FBI did for the Warren Commission, all right? And he was going to invite the press there. He actually announced that. All right. And he was going to hire independent investigators. Not going to use the FBI and the CIA. All right. And he was going to have, you know, independent uh, medical doctors. All right. And he had a fleet of, I think, 13 lawyers. And one of the first things that he did is that he did a um, a review of all the photographic evidence. And according to Al Lewis, this lasted all day, you know, for about about six hours. All right. And before the presentation began, Sprague turned around to all the aides there and said, I don't want anybody to leave unless I leave and I don't plan on leaving. Mm. Okay, and so uh, Al Lewis told me that when that when those presentations were over, okay, uh, out of the thirteen lawyers, twelve of them did not believe the Warren Commission anymore. All right, and I talked to one of the investigators, Al J. Delsa, and he told me when they when they looked at the Zapruder film and the autopsy evidence, you know, they just something's really screwy here. Okay, with this autopsy evidence and the and and the Zapruder film. So in that phase, under Sprague and Tannenbaum, you know those guys were really looking at the Kennedy case like a homicide. They were really looking at the evidence, the, the hardcore evidence that is the autopsy, the Zapruder film, the photographs, and they were leaning towards the critics. You know, and so the Warren Commission was really under siege then. But the media began to attack Sprague incessantly. I think there was a five-part series in the New York Times. Oh wow! And then, and then at the end of the series, uh, they did an. This is what they usually do. Then they did an editorial asking Sprague to resign. Okay, you know, I think Walter Pincus called the House Select Committee one of the most irresponsible, you know, uh, outrageous government bodies ever created, all right? 
And so that's when these when these attacks began. And then there began to be this quarrel between Henry Gonzalez, the new chairman, and Sprague. And Sprague actually won that because the the people on the committee ended up backing him over Gonzalez. But it was a pirate victory because, you know, you don't dispose of a committee chairman in Washington. See, those guys, those 435 congressmen, that's what they live for. They live to become a committee chairman. And here you had a guy, you know, disposing of a committee chairman. So the word got out that they, see, that committee was not a standing committee. It was what they call a special or a select committee. So it had to come up for funding um, every other year, I think. And so when the funding issue came up, the Congress made it clear that we're not funding this as Sprague stays. Because what happened to Gonzalez? So Sprague resigned. Actually, Tannenbaum told me, Tannenbaum resigned first. He wanted to leave first because of the problems he was having getting the committee to call back David Phillips. Okay. I, should I go into that? I think I should go into that, shouldn't I? Uh, I mean, I definitely am more kind of want to get a sense of the things that made an impact on the on the public mind. I don't, if you think that's, uh, if you think that was kind of in the public view, then yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. See, Sprague had interviewed David Phillips before Tannenbaum got there. Okay, and Phillips had said that there were no tapes that survived, and there were no pictures. Okay, he told Sprague that the um, uh, the camera was out that day. All right, and they destroyed their tapes. All right, so Tannenbaum called him back because, as Mark Lane writes in his book, Last Word. You know, he had come up with this memo that said the FBI agents in Dallas had heard this um, this tape, except it wasn't Oswald. So Tannenbaum calls Phillips back, and he has his chief investigator there and about four or five congressmen. He passes out the memo, you know, and he asks Phillips, how can you explain what you told Sprague which I wasn't here for, but I had the transcript of, that there were no tapes, when in fact, on November 23rd, the FBI heard the tapes, okay? And so Phillips picked up the memo, looked at the memo, oh, and then oh, also Bob told me in the radio, phone interview, he said, the other thing you wanted to ask Phillips was, why did you not correct this in the seven weeks between when Oswald was supposed to be in Mexico City and to the day of the assassination. Why was this not corrected? You know, that's the main question he wanted to ask him. Well, Phillips folded up the memo, put it in his jacket pocket, and walked out. And so uh, Tannenbaum wanted to get him called back, and he wanted to issue him a warning that once we get you back here, you better have a lawyer because I'm going to ask you to explain the discrepancy in your testimony. Well, the committee thought that was too aggressive, okay? And so they balked at bringing him back. And so Tannenbaum told Sprague, I'm going to resign, okay? And Sprague said, you can't resign, you know? And, and, and he goes, because they're going to make me resign. And there's nobody going to be here, okay? And so the committee will probably die. So... They worked it out that Sprague would resign. Tannenbaum and Al Lewis would stay there, okay, until they came up with a replacement so the committee would not go down the drain. All right? And so that's when Chris Dodd came up with Bob Blakey, this college professor, who I don't think ever handled the murder case in his life. I don't think he was ever the lead prosecutor on a murder case in his life. And he completely changed... Sprague's approach, all right? He completely changed. I'll give you a couple of examples. Sprague wanted to call regular press conferences because he thought it was necessary 
to, for them to be honest with the public. All right. Well, Blakey called one press conference and said, this will be my last press conference. All right. Okay. And, and until the hearings were held, that was the case. All right. Secondly, Sprague wanted to challenge every aspect of the case from the beginning. All right. In other words, from was Oswald in the sixth floor? Did Oswald order that rifle? Could somebody get off three shots in six seconds? All right. How the heck did CE-399 get there? Did Oswald shoot Tippett? Okay. Those kind of basic questions. Well, Blakey really never questioned any of that stuff. Okay. All right. He never really questioned the providence of the rifle. You know, he to this day, he says he believes in CE-399. Okay? You know, and and that was his approach. And his approach until the hearings came out was that they would work, essentially, in secret. And he made all the employees sign non-disclosure agreements. They wouldn't talk to the press, even after the investigation was over. And also, he did get access to the FBI and CIA documents, but he had to sign an agreement that before the report was published, the CIA and the FBI would have a right of review over the final reports. In other words, whatever went into the volumes and the final report had to be cleared in advance by those agencies. So this is why, for example, the Lopez report was not published because as Eddie Lopez told me when I asked him that question, he said, Jim, this is what happened. Me and Danny Hardaway was Eddie's partner on that. Mike Goldsmith, who was their chairman of that particular committee, subcommittee, and and Blakey got in a room with two guys from the CIA. And since they had the right to final review, they had to start going through the report. All right? And Eddie said words to the effect, it took five hours to get through the first seven sentences. All right? And so therefore... Blakey was not going to do that because he just figured it out. It would have been taken over a year to get through the report. All right. And so that's why it didn't get published. All right. So that was, see, it was kind of a pay Peter to, 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 to pay off, you know, you know, steal from Peter to pay Paul. In other words, the investigators got the access to the files, but more or less, the public did not. Hmm. Okay? And so that was a deal. And because they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, you know, you were you were risking going to court if any of the investigators said anything <laughs> about what they saw. Right. Eddie was one of the very few guys. Eddie and Danny were two of the very few guys who actually spoke to the public in the interim. So, you know, that's that was the problem with that approach. Right. So let's, uh, no, I mean, when you talk about the findings of the HSCA, they did conclude there's a 95 some odd percent chance of a conspiracy. And then Blakey comes out with his The Mob Did It book, did uh, which although it wasn't in the official report, you know, it was kind of the report focused, I guess, on anti-Castro Cubans and said some some of these people should be sent to the Justice Department and the Justice Department should look into it. Now, did this have, make any impact in the media at all, or did the media immediately kind of discount this, uh, the findings of the HSCA as, as weak or tentative as they were? Let me, uh, let me answer that in two ways. Okay, first of all, the impact of 
the um, acoustics evidence at first was pretty powerful, all right? But then the powers that be decided to do uh, certain committee reports to try and discredit it, all right? And so that weakened, you know, the, the impact of the whole... Because Blakey had banked almost everything for his second assassin on the grassy knoll on the acoustical evidence, okay? All right, and so that ended up being kind of confused. But then the other thing that he did is that he said if there was a second assassin, that it was a mafia plot. And then he had the problem of fitting Lee Harvey Oswald into the mafia plot. All right. Which which is, to put it mildly, it's very hard to do. Okay, and as more and more evidence has come out, you know, it's even harder to do. Okay, because some of the evidence that Blakey relied upon, uh, let's put it this way, has not been borne out, okay, by the declassified files, all right? And so this was what he was stuck with. So, you know, when although Blakey goes on TV these days and every once in a while for one of these specials, it's usually for a mafia did it, you know, kind of angle, you know, to the crime. You know, and I, 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 I you know, I had an offer to appear with Blakey uh, in Las Vegas a few years ago. I, I, did, I, did, I really didn't even want to go because I, I think essentially what Bob Blakey did was um, he put another disguise diversion you know onto the onto the JFK case because I don't I don't really think in my opinion I really don't believe that his theory his ultimate conclusion you know is a viable one I just don't a I, I don't think uh, the single bullet theory is believable or credible in fact to me, it's been pretty much annihilated with the newest evidence we have. And number two, I I don't believe that Traficante or Giancana or Rosselli would have ever in their right mind hired Oswald as a hitman. Right. You know, they, they, they had access to some pretty good marksmen. So why on earth would they employ this guy who couldn't hit the broadside of a barn door and when he left the service, you know, as an assassin. So I just don't think that Blakey's ultimate conclusions, you know, are very viable today. Right. Uh, and But they, I mean, they didn't cause anyone in the media to, to even, they, they never changed their note. Even at the HS, end of the HSCA, you still, the media was still straight away. Oswald did it, right? Most of, most of the media, most of the media, you know, acknowledged what the HSCA concluded, but it didn't very, it didn't have a very lasting effect with the mainstream media. Okay, um, most of the mainstream media, if you ask them, you know, the, these positions, the guys who are in positions of power, they're going to go along with the Warren Commission. The, the impact that Blakey had, if he had any, and he did have some, you know, was that if there was an alternative, okay, he wanted to make the alternative the mafia, okay? Right. And, I, and in my opinion, he was successful in that. He did make that, you know, a, you know an alternative, okay? Because most people today, if you ask them, you know, if you don't believe the Warren Commission, what do you believe? You know, the two leading candidates are the CIA and the mob. Okay? So he was successful in that aspect. Right. Okay, so that's that's the late 70s. Now you've got the whole decade of the 80s. And I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that, but we do finally, you know, for whatever the reasoning was, that it was allowed to to be made. Oliver Stone's JFK comes out, and the AARB, uh, 
you know, begins to go through these documents. Do you want to talk about Stone's film, the effect it had, and then start to talk about some of the major things that you have, because you've done a lot of work with the AARRB material. Do you want to talk about some of the more interesting uh, things that have come out of that? Okay, Oliver Stone's movie, um, JFK, is largely based upon Jim Garrison's memoir on the Trail of the Assassins. And, but he did bring in some supplementary material. And a lot of that dealt with Vietnam. Okay, now, Jim Garrison did believe, by about 1968-1969, that Vietnam was one of the reasons for the Kennedy assassination, right? Um, and in fact, there's a not very well-known interview that he did uh, towards the end when he says words to the effect that the Kennedy assassination was much larger much more sinister than I thought of when I started this thing. And today I firmly believe the Vietnam War was part of it. All right. And I think that's in um, John Barber's film, okay, um, where, where he says words to that effect. All right. Um, but the point is that they took that uh, even further than what Garrison knew or felt because they, Fletcher Prouty worked on Kennedy's withdrawal plan in the fall of 1963. Him and his boss, Victor Krulak, okay, actually wrote the McNamara-Taylor report. Um, this was a mission that Kennedy sent those two men on to Saigon uh, to write up a progress report and Kennedy did not trust them to actually write up the report. So he had Bobby Kennedy supervise the writing of that report. And then it was jetted out to Hawaii. And it was in a bound form, okay, to those two men. And they read it on the way in. And that was the basis for NSAM 263. And NSAM 263, which is prominently featured in the movie, okay, is the order to begin withdrawing 1,000 troops from Vietnam in December of 1963 that can be completed by the fall of 1965, all right? And the other source for that information was the fact that uh, the screenwriter, Zachary Squire and Oliver Stone, had access to John Newman, the manuscript for John Newman's revolutionary book, JFK in Vietnam, all right? And that was really the, well, it was the first book that had as its central thesis that Kennedy was going to be withdrawing from Vietnam, that he was assassinated before he could enact that program, and that Lyndon Johnson then went ahead and reversed that policy in just a matter of weeks which has turned out to be true because the impact of the film was so powerful because of the tagline that was placed on as a title at the end where it said, words to the effect, the files of the House Select Committee have been classified until the year 2039. That embarrassed um, Mr. Stokes who replaced Henry Gonzalez as the chairman of that committee. And his daughter asked him as they were leaving the theater, Daddy, how come you kept those secret? <laughs> okay. so, so when they got back to Washington, you know, there was testimony. Oliver Stone was one of the witnesses. And they came up with this citizens committee called the ARB, Assassination Record Review Board, that was in effect from 1994 to 1998, and it declassified 60,000 documents in over 2 million pages. And one of them, one of the documents, I think there was about 800 pages on Vietnam, one of them was the records of the 1963, the May 1963 SEC death conference in which Robert McNamara 
has a meeting of all the CIA, State Department, and Pentagon guys from Vietnam, flies them into Hawaii, and he goes, I want the schedules for a withdrawal plan that's going to be starting in December of this year. And every person that you employ is going to be out of here, is going to be out of Vietnam by the fall of 1965. And when he and when he got the schedules at that meeting, he turns to the people there and says, this is too slow. Hmm. Okay, we have to be faster. Now, what's very interesting about that, and I haven't really addressed this question, but I think it's important to address it. The reason McNamara probably said that, okay, and if you take that in tandem with a document that the wonderful British researcher Malcolm Blunt got for me, okay, and he sent to me, Kennedy had ordered an evacuation plan for Vietnam in November of 1963. And he actually got, he actually got it back before he was assassinated, all right? In my opinion, in my opinion, the reason McNamara said that and the reason that Kennedy ordered that evacuation plan is because they were worried, okay, that the communists would take over the country before 19, late 1965. They, they, they were that worried, okay? And that's how that's how bad, okay, that uh, McNamara and Kennedy thought about the Saigon government. Hmm. All right. So that turned out to be absolutely true. And by the way, the shocking thing about those documents, which were declassified in 1997, is that the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer both were forced to admit that Kennedy had a withdrawal plan in place in 1963. In other words, what Oliver Stone said six years earlier, and he caught all kinds of hell for, now the mainstream media six years later is now admitting was true. Wow. Okay. So the ARB, unfortunately, did not get a lot of publicity, and they probably were underfunded. And they probably did not stay, in my opinion, they lasted for four years. And that probably wasn't enough to do the job, okay? In my opinion, the ARB should have had a lifetime of about seven years, okay? Because as we can see now, there's many, many documents that weren't released. The official count is that over 3,000 documents that weren't released, but a researcher out of Houston named Ramon Herrera, who's doing an article for Kenny's and King.com, um, he actually places that figure as three times that amount, as over 9,000 documents that haven't been released. Hmm. Now, there was a loophole in the law referring to ongoing operations and names of agents, but if you see a lot of these documents they don't relate to that loophole, okay? So in my opinion, they were just simply being illegally withheld, all right? So Oliver Stone's movie created a lot of interest in the JFK case. A lot of books were published. For a period of about 10 months, he actually put the JFK case back in play. You know, he got the ARB created. But the problem is that... The other side decided, you know, enough is enough. And so they commissioned specifically Robert Loomis and Harry Evans at Random House, commissioned Gerald Posner to write this book called Case Closed. And then they waited for the 30th anniversary to spring their trap. Okay. And so in 1993, they gave Case Closed probably the biggest publicity buildup that I can ever remember, okay, around a single nonfiction book. Hmm. 
You know, I, I think you have to go back to maybe In Cold Blood to find a book that got the build up and the and the uh, the publicity tour that that book got. Um, you know, the cover U.S. News and World Report, ABC special, all right, uh, national tour, many talk shows. Uh, you know, and they used that terrible, awful book, you know, to go ahead and build up the 1993 30th anniversary, you know, as an Oswald did it again, did it again. And, and it's very unfortunate, in my opinion, for a lot of different reasons, you know, that they did that. Okay. Because, you know, case closed is just a horrendous book all the way around. How can you just begin with the title? How can you say a case is closed when two million pages of documents are being released? Many of which completely obliterate Posner's book. You know? Right. I mean, the book was bad enough to begin with on its own terms. You know? But these new documents completely vitiate several of the of the tenets that he has in that book. But see, it, does, it didn't matter to them. It didn't matter to them. In that famous ad, their whole idea was, number one, we're going to rally around this book to obliterate Oliver Stone's movie. Number two, we're going to demonize the critics. And number three, we're not going to put them on any of our shows anymore. Hmm. And that was the plan, and that's what they did. Because in the famous New York Times ad, the, I think it was a two-part ad, that Harold Evans paid for at Random House. You know, he 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 accused people like Jim Mars, Oliver Stone, Jim Garrison, Robert Groden, and David Lifton. The famous ad was guilty of misleading the American public. Mm. All right? Okay, and then he said, next week we'll find out the truth. And so the second part of the ad, one assassin... One gun, case closed by Gerald Posner. Well, of course, now we know, of course, that the gun, the rifle in evidence that the Warren Commission says that Oswald used to kill Kennedy, uh, that's not even the rifle the Warren Commission says that Oswald ordered. Okay, so, <laughs> so that was a big problem, which, of course, Harold Evans didn't give a damn about, you know. Do you, do you, are you good for a, a few more minutes? A couple more questions? I don't know how if you've got uh, you've got to take off. Let's find you. Okay, I, I, I can give you a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Because I definitely wanted to uh, kind of get to the 2017 stuff, and you know, I know there's uh, a lot of important researchers like John Newman and Jefferson Morley and uh, Bill Simpich have been very interested. I think in you know what could be coming out in 2017 about. Uh, George Ioannidis and other CIA things. Do you have any specific hopes for 2017 uh, of what you want to see come out? Well, see, the thing is, as I alluded to earlier, the see the the index that we have of these documents was due to a FOIA request, okay, by a certain individual, and the index. See, and this is very worrisome to me. Because the index they prepared is very, very sketchy. I think you can see it at who, what, where, why. Okay, Russ Baker's site. Oh, and okay. I think we have it at, we have it at Kennedy's and King.com also. Okay. And it's, it, to say that it's sketchy doesn't even really tell you how sketchy it really is. Because it basically says the originating body, okay, when the document was originated, all right, and the general heading on the document. And and that's about it. It doesn't tell you the page number, how many pages are in the document. Okay. Uh, and some of them, some of the boxes are not even filled in. So we don't even know who the originating body on the document was. And there's no description of of what type it is. In other words, is it a report? Is it an interview? And so Ramon Herrera, uh, like I said, 
managed to go ahead and do his own inquiry into the NARA database that is a National Archives database. And he says that the number of documents is wrong, okay, upon his inquiry. And he says that it's really more like over 9,000 documents that have been withheld. Now, you would think that in such an important subject as this, in other words, supposedly the final document release ever by the federal government in the JFK case, that the National Archives will be working overtime to try and put together the very best index of documents that they could, that they could possibly do. Because there, whether or not they believe it or not, there is going to be some uh, publicity to this occasion. Okay? You know? All right. And so, and there's going to be a lot of researchers there on that day going through these documents. All right? So you would think the National Archives, you know, would have enough respect for that occasion and the death of President Kennedy to put together a really good index, number number one, an accurate index. You know, are there 3,400 or are there 9,300? Okay. Mm -hmm. or, you know, and really describe what the document is consistently throughout, you know, with all the information so we can go find them once they're issued. So I'm very, very disappointed in the fact that they haven't done a better job on this, you know. And I don't know whose fault that is, you know, but you, you can bet that once Ramon's article comes out, which will be in about a week, okay, that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about this particular issue, you know. See, the ARB, like I said earlier, the ARB was underfunded, and it didn't have enough um, of a uh, budget, and it didn't have enough time. For instance, when they went to Russia, the KGB had a very large, extensive file on Lee Harvey Oswald, which would be very important if you ask me. You know, but they wanted money for it hmm. because, of course, this was at Yeltsin began to ruin the economy. The whole country is going down the tubes, you know, and so they wanted money and the ARB couldn't come up with enough money. Well, that's funny because they spent 16 or some odd million on the Zapruder film, right? No, that wasn't the ARB. Oh, that okay. was Congress. Oh, okay, okay. You know, you know, and so, you know, and so, you know, that's what I mean. The ARB did, if you ask me, the ARB did a kind of adequate job considering that they were underfunded and that they were, um, did not last long enough. You know, one of the better chapters in Doug Horn's book, Inside the ARB, is the, uh, and I wish it was longer, you know, he spent about, because he was on the ARB, he has about 16 pages on the, Assassinations Record Review Board. And it's pretty interesting, if you ask me. Hmm. Like David Marwell, the first chief counsel, you know, would have lunch with Gerald Posner. You know, uh, uh, there was not there was not one picture, let alone a wall portrait, of Kennedy in the ARB headquarters. You know? So this was, you know... You know, did the ARB did a good do? Did they do a good job? Did they do a bad job? The, another thing that really bothers me is that, you know, Thunheim, when he was invited to Washington by the CAPA to do a speech, you know, is still going by that Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy. Hmm. You know, you you wonder, did he read his own documents? You know, the Jeremy Gunn. Jeremy Gunn was the chief counsel for I think three out of the four years. You know, and Jeremy Gunn did a inquiry into the medical evidence. You know, if if you ask me, just the ARB inquiry into the medical evidence pretty much videates the idea that Oswald shot Kennedy. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into the whole thing because that will take another two hours. But, you know, their inquiry into that, you know, because they, they did several depositions they actually found a couple of new witnesses, actually more than a couple, you know, and uh, they did a fairly good job on that aspect, 
you know, I mean, you, you got the, the, the testimony of the photographer, you know, Stringer. Mm-hmm. You know, when he, when Jeremy Gunn took him to the National Archives and showed him the pictures of the brain, you know, Stringer was speechless because he looked at the pictures. He looked at the the actual name of the film, you know, and, and Gunn asked him, did you take these pictures? And he said, no. Mm. And he said, well, how do you know you didn't take them? He goes, because see that name at the bottom of that film? I never used that film. Okay. You know, and said, so you see the way this, the, the picture is taken, you know, you know, the, the thickness of the thing goes, I never used that process. Okay. Mm. That's called a press pack. I never used press pack. Okay, you know, and so he said, so Gundon said, so you're denying here under oath that these are your photographs. And he says, yes. You know, so you, you wonder, did, 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 uh, did Thunheim read that interview? Right. You know, so the question is, at the very least, who took those pictures? And the secondary question of any investigation would have to be, how come? Why do they need a second photographer, you know, to come in and take the actual pictures of the brain? And I think that anybody who has studied this case will come to the conclusion that the pictures of the brain in the National Archives today are phony. They, you check out all the witness testimony. There's much too much damage. There's about 16 witnesses who will testify to there being much, much more extensive damage to the brain than what is depicted in those pictures. And also what the official measurement is. Because the official measurement was 1,500 grams. That's too large for an intact brain. Okay? Let alone all the damage that all these people saw. So, you know, you, you really wonder, you know, what is Tuna I'm talking about? You know, so that's another good thing the ARB did. Right. So let me let me ask you one last one last question. Uh, where do you think we'll be in in 2063? Do you think the press will finally have caught up to public opinion, or do you think it could go the other way? Uh, what are your hopes for, or or what do you see happening? And and as this thing finally goes down into history, as it must, as the generations who live through it kind of pass on. Okay, so you're talking about the hundredth anniversary. Yeah, you know, just what do you, do you think will ever change? Yeah. Look, I think if you asked the first generation of critics, people like Ray Marcus, you know, and um, Harold Weisberg, and uh, Sylvia Marr, among others, I think if you would have asked them, do you think the cover-up will hold for 25 more years? You know, I think they would have said no, because I think the people in the media who were part of that will have passed on by then, okay? And, and so we'll have more freedom for people to really investigate the truth. Well, that didn't happen. And what happened instead at the 30th anniversary, like I said, they got behind Posner's book, the 40th anniversary... Peter Jennings came out with his horrendous special, ABC special. That the 50th anniversary was the worst of all. It was the worst of all. It was just one of the most unbelievably shocking, you know, exhibitions of CYA that I've ever seen in my life. Okay, I, even me, someone as skeptical as me, was stunned by that and by the another the fact that the the powers that be in Dallas decided they weren't going to let to have the critics anything to do with Dealey Plaza. If you recall, the uh, Bellow Corporation, which owns the major newspapers and TVs there, okay, got together with the sixth floor, all right, and the mayor, and they decided to fence off Dealey Plaza, 
literally, okay, and then control everything that came out of it, all right, and I was actually there, and it was really something to see. <clears throat> if the Dallas police had that much security out for John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy would never have been shot, you know, <clears throat> but in this one, they had literally 200 cops at every entry point. They had policemen on horseback, if anybody broke through. Yes. All right? Okay? And you had to be cleared through Homeland Security to be invited into Dealey Plaza. And then they had David McCullough do the address for John F. Kennedy. If, if anybody can tell me where David McCullough ever did any work on John F. Kennedy, either his life or death, I'd like to see it. Okay? But it was a complete setup job. That's how worried they were. Because they knew there would be literally scores of press people there. And they did not want to risk having anybody there to give the dissenting story. All right? They didn't want John Newman on international TV. Okay? They didn't want Ting Thompson, you know, being interviewed by any alternative media. Mm. They didn't want anybody like that to get on TV because they wanted to control the message coming out of Dallas. And then the guys in New York City got a dying Vincent Bugliosi through the auspices of Tom Hanks to do a special, you know, for them. I think that was on CNN. So this is how bad this has become. It's become like an institutionalized, you know, union memory of suppression. So if you ask me, do I think things will change in the long-term future? I, off that example, I'd have to say no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But, see, they, they can't control the Internet. That's what we have in our favor. Okay? Mm -hmm. So as long as there's people like you, there's people like me, there's people like Rex Bradford, there's people like Deborah Conway, you know, uh, then we get our message out and we do pretty well. Okay. All right. Well, good. Is there is there anything else else that you want to add? Well, I, I well, okay. When you did my introduction, you forgot reclaiming Parkland. Okay, that's the uh, the other book I wrote that just a few years ago, and. In addition to the releases of the ARB in October, there's going to be a mock trial in Houston in November. Okay. Oh, okay. And that should be that should be an interesting event. They got Alec Baldwin to be the master of ceremonies for the dinner that's going to be on the first night. There's oh. going to be a two day trial at the University, I think it's the University of um of uh South Texas or something like that. We have it up. Larry Schnapp was one of the attorneys. He did an article for Kennedy's and King. So you can get all the information there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, thanks a lot. This was, I think we, we really covered a lot of history. I wasn't sure if we could do it, but, uh, you know, thanks a lot. You are really a wealth, a wealth of knowledge on all this stuff. So I appreciate your, okay. your time. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot, Jim. This has been Our Hidden History. 